So, the story so far. 15 years ago, I had a dream to create a global luxury skincare brand. And 15 years later, here we are. My brand, Rodial, is available in 35 countries and the most luxurious stores worldwide, including Harrods, Harvey Nichols, Space & K. Our products are loved by consumers, industry experts, and celebrities worldwide. I couldn't be happier, but there's always drama and a lot of hard work. And none of this would have been possible without my team and close friends supporting me all the way. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Hi everyone. For, for joining Hello. us today. Um, really excited to talk through uh, a little bit about the industry and how it's changed, and Maria's business. Um, it's wonderful to see such a full room for fashion. Uh, it doesn't feel that long ago that fashion and technology were seen as kind of opposite ends of a spectrum. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, Maria, thank you very much for, for, for coming today. It's good to have thank you here. Thank you for having me. Um, so, I, I hopefully am not the only geek in the room that, that uh, was salivating over Facebook's um, Q3 results yesterday. And it was really stunning to realize the scale of how much has changed in media and communications over the last 15 years. Um, Facebook's results saying that there's over a billion daily, uh, daily visitors, daily users on Facebook. Uh, we have over 8 billion daily uh, video views on Facebook, YouTube, we've got 1.4 million users, Snapchat, I mean just so much has changed in the industry. Um, and we're now really seeing that impact on, on fashion and luxury and, mm. and consumer goods and all those things. So Maria, I'd love to get your view on, on how much change you've seen over the last 15 mm. years since you set up the business. Uh, things have massively changed since I started my business 15 years ago. Uh, the first days, it was all about creating buzz with zero budget, and you needed to be creative about how to make things happen for the brand. And we were the, doing the traditional route of traditional PR, trying to get the product to the hands of celebrities, and then connect with the publicist, uh, get, try to get a quote, place that quote with the publication, and then the celebrity would say, oh, I'm using XYZ product, and then your product would sell out. So this is the way we used to do it 15 years ago. And it was really hard, it was labor intensive. But I feel now we have this huge gift of social media where every startup and every brand can really make an impact. Every brand can make everyone aware about their products, they can create buzz, and it's all by using these platforms, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, it's all about communicating with the consumer. That's really interesting. Something else that sort of struck me just now is, is one of the key things that, that you do as a company is creating products for people with sort of specific concerns or issues. Yeah. And I was wondering if perhaps one of the reasons why your business has been so successful is that, that in this new world of social, when people are sharing things and looking for solutions and talking with each other, maybe you've seen particular success because of that. You're looking to not just shift product, mm. but really help people with their lives. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's all about connecting with the consumer and finding the right media and also the right influencers mm. to work with. Um, and again, going back to what we used to do in the old days, the influencers were film stars and they were um, artists and, and singers. And, and there were those distant people that they had these major campaigns, but then no one was connecting with them. And right now, the, uh, the scene of influencers has changed. And what you see is that uh, people really want to connect with a product in a very different way, yeah. and they want to connect with the influencer that is not just this, this big super duper celebrity, but they're also very savvy on social media. They manage their own profile through Instagram and they connect with the consumer. So the, the days where you would put the product on a pedestal and you would deliver this massive advertising campaign, the consumer mm -hmm. is not connecting with that anymore. Now it's all about using the right influencers to connect with the consumer and create a community. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so I, I run a media business and, and a big challenge that media industry has had over the last 15 years is that this notion of destinations is kind of dead. So 
we used to feel really safe and secure in our newspapers and our magazines yeah. that people would come to and our websites that people would come to. But now it's, we try and think about the web more in terms of kind of channels and you have like Facebook as a channel yeah. and, and Twitter and Snapchat. But then when I was looking at your business, it really made me realize that actually the destinations are still there. They're just very different to what they used to be. We had one of the Kardashians yesterday announcing that she had 40 million followers wow. on Instagram. It's just astounding. But I think one thing that lots of people struggle with, um, which I'd love to get your view on, is, is how you build those relationships with, with influencers. Yeah. Because in the old days, you just phoned up their agent and said, here's a check. Um, can you like wear our t-shirt or something like that? But it, it kind of lacks substance. H how mm -hmm. have you thought about that? Uh, that's a really good question and I, I get it all the time. Um, over the last few years, we have worked with a number of influencers and celebrities. And um, the key thing to everything is authenticity. There are times where a celebrity or an influencer is paid by a brand uh, and you look at the connection and you think, how on earth did that happen? You can never imagine XYZ celebrity or influencer to be using that brand. And that is a connection that's not authentic and consumers can see through. And the result of that is a disaster. It's, it's a waste of money for the brand. Um, what we do as a brand, and, and we have very tight budget still, so whatever we invest, we need to make sure we do get a return on an investment. Uh, we do like to um, meet influencers. We do want to see a real connection with the brand before we take them on board. And as we were talking backstage, this is how uh, we got together with Kylie Jenner, who is the youngest of the Kardashian clan. Um, she got... Um, um, she got one of our products, one of the Nippon Fab range, which is the youngest range that we do. She got hold of it at a photo shoot and then Instagram to her 40 million followers. And that was unbelievable. Suddenly it got half a million views and we got a lot of our customers getting interested. And so we thought, that's great. You have a celebrity who is a global beauty icon. Everyone knows her. She has a very active um, social media following. And that would make a great partnership for us, knowing that she already had this authentic relationship with the brand made it really easy. And then we brought her to London, we did a lot of events, we created a lot of content, and that resulted in a unbelievable partnership that benefited both the brand and her image as well. So whatever type of influencer we're working with, whether that's a blogger, whether that's um, a celebrity, it's all about finding that real connection so when you go out to the market, everyone knows that this person really likes the product and that's the key sure. to success. We, um, when we were speaking a couple of days ago, um, I was describing the fact that in my experience, many kind of luxury brands had spent hundreds of years building up this very aspirational, unaccessible brand and that's kind of what their business was predicated on. Like, um, uh, Rolex is something that everyone wants because very few people can have it mm. and that something that those brands have really struggled with is, is adapting to this new world and adapting to the era of Snapchat and Instagram and I think many of those brands spent a long time shying away from it and just thinking oh like we don't really want to do that we want to stay away from it um, and whilst they were doing that Burberry was kind of trebling their market value mm. because they absolutely lent into those things can you talk a bit about um, how you see the role of of kind of luxury and prestige in social and what you do? Like, how do you maintain mm -hmm. something that's got real value and, and something you believe in and you've put lots of work in, um, but also you're, you're putting it out on these social mm -hmm. platforms that some people or some of your competitors might see as being quite disposable and, and maybe not, not prestigious mm -hmm. enough? Mm -hmm. I still feel that there is a big market out there for luxury products. Um, there's still market for hero products, for something that the market would covet. But at the same time, we need to address the younger generation and we need to be current. Yep. And for example, we talked about the Chanel exhibition at the Saatchi yeah. Gallery in London that brought the whole of the Chanel history to the eyes of um, anyone from, from teenagers to students. And I feel this is the way to go. You have Burberry Snapchatting their collection or Snapchatting a big event. 
Uh, and I feel that as a brand, it, whether you're doing high luxury or whether you're doing mass, you really need to be addressing your audience at the platforms where they're at. And if the platform is not Snapchat, you need to be there. If it's YouTube, you need to be there. So it's working with your audience, and rather than getting them to come to your platform, you need to be as a brand at their platform. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so you've talked about influencers. Could you go into a bit more detail about the kind of the things you are doing outside of, of influencers, kind of when you look at your marketing strategy for the year ahead, um, what are the things you're doing? So YouTube, Instagram, like mm -hmm. what are the big... Well, everything we do, we try to have a 360 degree marketing approach. Um, so sometimes a campaign would start from Instagram and we have a great idea for an yep. Instagram shoot and we would take that into our um, email strategy, we could take this to the press, and we could also put together a clip for YouTube. Um, so we always, whatever we do, it's a circle, and we make, make sure we use the same content all around our platforms. Um, the latest platform that we have been growing, and there, there's still a lot of work to do, but it's, uh, it's exciting, it's, uh, it's our YouTube channel. Sure, yeah, so can you talk a bit more um, so I'm sure there are lots of people in this room who are experimenting with YouTube and trying out new video. Um, and obviously the, the kind of subject of content as a whole is very, uh, very topical right now. Mm. Which, which, what have you tried that's worked well and what mm. have you tried that you've actually yeah. thought, like next time maybe we won't do it like that? Yeah. It's, uh, YouTube is really interesting and uh, I can't really say that um, we have it perfect yet. Uh, we are doing a lot of trial and error and see what works well and see what feedback we get because it's a, it's a whole new territory out mm. there. Um, what I have found out is sometimes we would invest a lot of money into a big production of a, of a film, whether that's a behind the scenes, whether that's a product tutorial. Um, and, and then we would do the same with a lower production with just a camera and, and me or someone else just going through a tutorial and in a more intimate basis. And interestingly enough, we found a better engagement with a low cost production. Really? Just because the feedback that we're getting from our customers is they feel that uh, we have put the effort behind this, they can see um, who the real person is behind the brand, and they can feel that connection that sometimes you lose with big productions. Um, so that's, that's kind of it's a really win-win situation. Okay. Um, and I know that you have two, there's, there's two sort of key brands for you. Um, how do you differentiate between those two? Because you're, you're, I mean, you've had incredible growth over the last 15 years, but obviously there are lots of players out there who yeah. have kind of multi-billion dollar ad budgets. Um, how do you build a community? I mean, are they two totally separate communities or is there mm. overlap? Like, yeah. can you talk through that a little bit? Um, yeah, so um, I don't know if everyone's aware, we have two brands. Uh, Rodial is our luxury brand and Nip and Fab is our mass brand for a younger audience. And we operate both brands from the same, uh, the same group, the same company. Um, what we have done is um, we have done uh, a branding exercise, which was an internal meeting of everyone in the office to go through the uh, different branding elements of each brand, and we developed two books. And uh, we talk about the tone of voice, uh, we talk about the type of assets, the images, the colors that we use, and how we, we communicate with the two different target markets. And once we have um, made that distinction, Everything is very simple because how you um, address social media, how you put together your marketing strategy, the principles are the same whether you have a luxury brand or a mass brand. It's just a different tone of voice, a different look, different assets. So as long as you keep those two things separate, yeah. um, you can share the principles. Um, and I said you had two brands. Like, I think you really have three brands. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things about your business is, is what you've been doing recently. So um, Maria's been building, uh, it's very topical here in this format to talk about founders. Maria's been building a sort of brand around herself as well. So can you talk about Mrs. Rodil and, and, and what you're doing there? Uh, Mrs. Rodil has been an accident, which uh, is turning <laughs> us into something now. Wow. Um, so when, when we started um, Instagram, we had um, the, at Rodil Skincare, we had Admip and Fab. And I kind of wanted a, an account for me just to post my personal thing. So I said, you know, I have a very difficult last name. No one's going to be able to pronounce it. So 
let me come up with a name that's easier to remember. So I came up with a Mrs. Rodial handle. Yeah. Um, and then it was, it was an account where I would post anything from I love this shoe or I'm about to miss a flight or um, X, Y, Z is happening in my life or behind the scenes. And I didn't really have an agenda with it. It was just a fun um, platform for me. It was, it was a place where I would direct my creativity. And slowly, I, I just got a lot of engagement. And, and the fact that I'm, it's not about posting and selling products, it's about a genuine account. I got a great response, and suddenly Mrs. Rodial is, 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 a, is a brand, and I get to connect directly with our customers, with the audience, um, and they ask me all sorts of questions to yeah. um, what lipstick are you using, to where, is, where are your sunglasses from, I got a, um, a message this morning, and I just find it's a great and a fun way to connect with the consumer yeah. and, and make, um, make this community that everyone feels they're part of. It's, it's more personal, it's more direct, and I think it's more fun. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we talked about the be at the beginning about, we, so we had talked backstage that um, in publishing we've had this shift from just creating stuff that, that people just consume, but there's no reason to pass it on. And I think through creating this brand, you're, you're giving your company a far more uh, sort of social face. Like people might not want to share a product, but a story uh, from you, mm -hmm. um, an experience from you is, is much more social and, and feels much more native to the, the way people consume and share stuff today. Uh, the consumer needs to know the story. Uh, they need to know the story of the brand. The, the days that you put the product up in a pedestal and, and you had this massive campaign, this, these days are gone. No one can connect with that anymore. So for every brand is finding a way to connect your story, to connect your brand story to the consumer and, and just answer the question. The consumer is asking, what's in it for me? How can you solve my problem? Um, so we have to think in a very different way when we do marketing these days and, and make sure whatever we do, we solve the problem and we make it worth for the customer to be part of this community. And then once you get the customer into the community, then they will buy the product ultimately, but it's, it's not about the product. I mean, I almost, I almost feel that right now for, for any brand to succeed, we need to be a media company that produces content all the time that our audience will relate to. And then on the side, we also sell some product. I, I, I feel yeah. more like a media company right now. No, I, I agree, definitely. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, you're not just a, I think there's sort of a, a lazy interpretation of what it means to be a media company, which is you create stuff. Like, there's lots of people right now who are really excited about stuff, content and mm -hmm. video and all these things. And they miss the point that you don't want to be an old media business. Like, Trust me, I've, I've been there. You don't <laughs> want to be an old media business. You want to be a new media business. And what it means to be a new media business is, is what Maria is doing, which is um, creating stuff that's good enough that people will share. Like, like just talking about what you're doing is not very interesting. But, but mm -hmm. I know you do a lot of videos of, of tips and, and kind of um, Q&As with yourself. Yeah. Like, that's good enough that someone's going to watch mm -hmm. it and pass it on to their friends. And that's really the... I mean, yeah, this is, this is an interesting point, and that goes back to the YouTube channel, yeah. that I have been looking at YouTube channels of um, other beauty brands over the years, and it's all about tutorials, and it's all about makeovers, and I felt that we needed to be different, and I wanted it to be more of a platform where we can empower women and be a little bit more intelligent about what we offer. So it's not just about making you look good with a great lipstick, and we can do that, but I also want to be able to inspire you, and if you're starting your own business, or you have a bad day and you want a little bit of inspiration and fun, to create a channel where you can go um, and, and just be entertained from any point of view, and not just being makeovers. And I, we're working on that, we got some great feedback. Um, I got a comment the other day saying, oh, I watched your, um, how you started your business, and when I have a down day, and my, uh, my career is not going anywhere, I'm, I'm watching this, and I feel empowered. And that, to me, is yeah. worth it. It's, it's more worth it than 100,000 views. So, sure. getting great feedback. And do you have any, um, so we, we've got some great people in the crowd, like what would be your tips? If there's someone here, if there's the next Maria in the crowd, what would you say to them in terms of what they should be doing or thinking about? Um, I think the key thing is to just give a personality to your brand. So what, whatever you're doing, whatever industry you're in, your um, customer needs to know who is behind the brand, create a story, 
tell your story. I know at the beginning when you when you start up your business, you you're a bit shy, you don't want to talk about yourself, but this is really what people want to hear about. So don't be shy, just share your story and, and people will connect with you. I think that's that's the key tip that I would say. And then um, I feel that we are very fortunate right now to have social media in our hands and, and use it to your benefit. It's free. It does take a lot of engagement. It does take a lot of your time. I always say, as a brand owner, you need to be driving your social media. This is not a job for an intern. You need to learn it, go take a workshop, uh, watch some tutorials. I don't know what you need to do, but you need to drive your social media as a founder, as an owner. Um, and that's really important. And uh, tip number three is, mm. I always say that, uh, don't think outside the box, think like there's no box. And you need to be innovative, you need to come up with new ideas and, and create your own, your own story. So, these are Wonderful. my three tips. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Thanks.